Hello and welcome to today's meeting. I've got with me Nathan Barr of Health Bar and Eric Hanna of OVD. So we've got two great experts to talk about healthcare secrets revealed. Um, I'm going to be your host and moderator. I'm Jody Schaefer and owner of HRM Consulting. We're a consulting company, um, Human Resources out of the Lansing area. And so I'm really interested to hear about this conversation today. I have a lot of clients that are struggling, both from an employer perspective, but also as a consumer of healthcare. And now more than ever, it's on the front stage. So uh, without further ado, let's move into some introductions. Uh, Eric, if you wanna kick us off a little bit about your background and why this is an important topic for you. Yeah, I've been really excited to get into this topic. Um, you know, I've been in healthcare for about 20 years from different seats at the table, from running physician groups to being a decision maker within employers on how to roll out benefits, um, and now from the employee benefits consulting side. So I've seen this system we call healthcare, the inputs and outputs, and frankly, the crazy amount of waste that's in the system. There's about 20 or 30% of waste on um, you know, every dollar we're spending. And uh, you know the average cost for a family right now is about twenty-one thousand dollars, and it's just obscene. Yeah. Um, and so those two things combined, I think, motivate me. You know, from the lens that I look at it, to you know help employers, you know, become more efficient and engage their employees in different ways, so that we can have a better experience within sure. the system. Now, what's OVD? That's where we're coming to you from today, and and this is your employer of uh, of late. And so, yeah. tell us a little bit about what you do there. Yeah, so uh, I'm an employee benefits advisor at, at Oliver Van Dyke or OVD Insurance. Uh, we're in Grand Rapids. We have about 100 employees. We have employee benefits, uh, commercial, and personal lines. Uh, it's very family oriented, you know, locally owned and operated agency. Um, and uh, we really pride ourselves on a service model that, you know, really wraps around the employer group from whichever perspective. That we're engaged on. Sure, creative and customizable. I think are two um, sort of unusual ways to think about employee benefits from a typical insurance provider. So glad right. to have you here today. Right. And Nate, share with us a little bit about your background. Yeah, thank you. I um, am a registered nurse. I started practicing about 12 years ago, um, and really from that bedside component, um, just love taking care of people. You know, I uh, got a really good, great experience in the uh, healthcare environment. Uh, primarily in the emergency department and um, and started seeing some things that didn't really match up that well. Um, was able to take out some administrative roles and peel back the layers of the onion, um, you could say, and really got a full breadth of knowledge where I saw a mismatch of incentives, a mismatch of objectives from what a clinician would feel versus what maybe a hospital system or administrator would feel. And so really kind of putting all that together and thinking, you know, there's a system that's built backwards in a yeah. sense and, and, and really why are we doing it this way and and um, a lot of the things that prevents transparency in healthcare care and and truly driving quality outcomes really kind of built up in me um, over that time within the industry um, and so we decided to start a business called health bar um, which really focuses on a lot of the things healthcare is not doing so transparency access uh, quality outcomes things that really drive a better future um, and where I see medicine should be going. Great. So the idea of today's conversation is to talk about some of those healthcare secrets from an insider perspective. Um, and certainly the two of you bring up some really great vantage points to that. I think you've got some personal stories to share too that those listening will absolutely be able to relate to. Um, but it's not just some of those secrets, but it's what can we do about it, right? It's gonna be solution oriented. So um, we're looking at a really valuable, I think, conversation and a, and a good way to spend 30, 40 minutes of your time today. So uh, let's talk about the, the topic of transparency, Nate. You brought that up, lack of transparency and how Health Bar is really aimed at switching that. So um, from a transparency perspective, what's wrong with the system? and what can we do to uh, make some strides in the right direction? Yeah, as a consumer of healthcare, you you see a hospital and you go there when you're sick or injured or ill, and and it, it seems fairly basic on the front end. You go receive care, that care is delivered, and you leave. But really, I think what people don't really understand is how much goes on behind the scenes, truly, is, is you have those frontline clinicians providing that care, but that's the tip of the iceberg. There's there's so much below the water 
Um, and it's so much of what makes up our system today that that makes it nearly impossible to be fully transparent on those the other components of healthcare. Healthcare is a complete uh, ecosystem that exists far beyond the actual care being delivered. Um, and so situations where you have a patient and they, they receive that care, but they don't have any idea of what they're getting billed. They don't even know technically all that was delivered to them. You talk about situations where somebody goes to uh, the hospital and receives a typical medication like Tylenol and that Tylenol costs, you know, cents. That's the joke, right? Yeah. You get the bill and Tylenol is $60. $60 is exactly right. Yeah. It's exactly right. So it's, why does that exist and why does it cost so much? And there's, there's so many of those hidden little nuggets within that medical journey that exists where um, you don't even know what you're getting charged for. You're receiving a service, but that service is broken down into these little line by line charges. And it gets significantly down to detail of that nature to where you, a nurse handed a medication to a patient that costs money to a healthcare system. That's what's billed for. Uh, or a medications administered uh, through an uh, intravenous line. Those are all things that have very specific charges associated with them um, that make up this huge complex ocean of charges that comes through aftercare is delivered. And so there's, you think you really understand what's going on when you receive care, but the other components of that are, um, are wildly uh, complex, yes. Yeah. So where I start with transparency is, imagine we're a consumer in any other aspect of our life, buying a car. And we don't get to know how much it costs. We don't get to know what the interest rate is. We don't get to know all those buyer decision points until after we sign on the agreement saying we'll pay. It's insane, but we've somehow accepted that as consumers in healthcare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the system itself doesn't have motivation or incentive to do it a different way. It's working just fine from their perspective, right? While many of us as consumers, um, employers, and I, I include consumers as both employers and employees, the users of the system, um, are the ones really kind of footing the bill without, you know, uh, not only is the, maybe the foxes and guarding the hen house like kind of no one is. And so we've got to start with shining a light on at least where we can today, because it's, it's not great, but it's getting better, on where we can become consumers and engaged in our own healthcare buying decisions. And there's lots of decision points that we're not always aware of because the system is set up to go into more expensive levels of care. And we can get into any of those details, mm -hmm. but certainly you know, hospitals with employed physicians, they're encouraged to make the referrals into the hospital system. And yeah. if it's happening at a hospital facility, you can pretty well bet it's the most expensive version of that service, even if it's available in other places. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's assuming that the physician that you're seeing in that hospital, which maybe you're literate enough to know that that particular hospital's in network, right? Because we know that it's more expensive to go out of network. But maybe the physician you're seeing in that hospital, especially in an emergency room, isn't employed by that hospital, is employed by another group. Maybe there's a radiologist, right, that's contracted from another group who sees you in the emergency room, who you have no choice over, by the way, because you're in the emergency room. It wasn't planned or expected. And that radiologist, because they're employed with another group, that group happens to be out of network. And it's not until you get your bill that you recognize that disparity. So, I mean, it just sort of begs the next question, right? Complexity, how complex the system really is, and what are some things that employers and consumers can be doing to demystify the process? Yeah, the, the in-network, out-of-network component, I, I think how things are so siloed and segmented, and, and truly is, you go and receive that, that service, and it's provided by all these different layers, and it's, it is, it gets to that level of complexity, but then you, you get down to why Why are there in-network and out-of-network providers? Why in a system that we're seeking from a consumer side care in a situation where we a lot of times don't have a lot of choice? Um, why does it have to be set up that way to where an organization cannot operate with everything in, in network or not have networks at all more so? Um, and so that's where all of that conversation comes. It's we're providing this set of care to an individual. Let's look at that set of care 
maybe break it down into its parts because it is a, a business and um, you know, and revenue is generated from that, but um, take away that in-network and out-of-network complexity and, and really make it simpler. And that's where healthcare has driven itself to this complex structure where it needs to more so say, how do we simplify that structure? How do we get down to a part where these are questions now, but they don't have to be questions forever. Are there options to you know, help the consumer or provide services in another way? I mean, Nate, you said I was, I was an ER nurse and I was in a system and I saw all this craziness going on and I thought, this isn't, it doesn't have to be this way. And so you spun off and created Health Bar. So, you know, on the topic of in-network, out-of-network, Nate, you said getting rid of in-network, out-of-network altogether is one possible solution. Are companies doing that right now? Or are there concierge type offerings that just eliminate this altogether? Yeah, well, as a starting point from my perspective is, um, there is a new hospital transparency law that requires hospitals to post their top couple hundred procedures. And then there's services then that are kind of manipulating that so it makes it user friendly from a consumer end. Okay. And I think it's not nearly far enough, but it's at least kind of a start. Although, frankly, a lot of hospital systems are dragging their feet and not complying. Um, but it's at least kind of a path in the direction of how can we, how can we help the users of healthcare understand that the cost isn't just my cost share, that the cost is a total cost that's impacting the plan I'm part of, which might be my employer plan, and that impacts future premium too. So it's not just that my deductible is this much and my out-of-pocket max is this much, but if we're picking a $50,000 procedure that could be done maybe at even higher quality in some cases for 20. Um, it does impact me even though in the immediate I'm sometimes thinking about well what's my my cost share. Um, from a provider perspective you know there's data out there that says only about a third of patients identify a primary care physician and have a good relationship with a primary care physician. And I think uh, that's where services like Health Bar come in to help fill that gap of two thirds of us don't have that close relationship. And if we have one, we go and we see the, the physician for 10 minutes rather than a half hour, hour where they know us, they know our family, they know our history, they know our work stress, right. they treat us as a whole, a whole body. Um, and I think that's degraded in some ways the, the access into the system because we don't have that anchor point like we used to. Why do we, why do we not, why do two thirds of us not identify a primary care physician? I can tell you why I don't. Sure. Um, part of it is I, I never had one. I had like a pediatrician mm -hmm. until I was 18 and went to college. And then quite honestly, in my early 20s, all the way through to present day, I've been relatively healthy. So when I go see a doctor, it's because I have a very specific need and I'm basically looking for a referral. Um, with the exception of, because I'm female, I have an ob who is my yearly healthcare touch point. But aside from that, haven't had a primary care physician or the one that I did finally find because I thought I should be a grown up, <laughs> finally do this, um, became a hospitalist and got out of you know the the outpatient primary care altogether so you know you have that changing person so that's hard you talk about relationship building if the person keeps changing or they go from this practice to this practice to this hospital that's frustrating but also for all the reasons you said it's a complex expensive proposition and most of us are not going to subject ourselves to that if it's path of least resistance. We're human beings, path of least resistance, yeah. right? Yeah, there, there's so many things in there that I'd love to unpack. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it highlighted so many great things as you're saying it, and I'm thinking about it, and I really want to hit in on that comment of, you know, why, does, why do so many people not have mm -hmm. primary care physicians? And from my time in the emergency department um, through developing a business like Health Bar, you see the system, the healthcare system as it's built, and it's truly instead of i think health care it's a misnomer it's truly sick care yeah. health care is, is yeah. truly a sick care system and that's where if you look at the span of a, somebody's lifetime when do they get sick they usually get sick later in life you're feeling you're young you're healthy and you, you think you're doing great like i don't need a primary care doctor because i feel great because we think of 
needing a provider as something that I need when I'm sick, not when I'm feeling good. And it's truly the paradigm shift that I think healthcare needs to take is how do we engage individuals in a primary care fashion, in a health promotion and prevention fashion to say, I want to interact with Nate as my provider. I want to interact with my healthcare provider in that way to be a coach and a mentor and and somebody that's actually gonna help keep me healthy, not only treat me when I'm sick. And then if you think about it that way, it transitions that mindset from this sickness approach to more of this wellness approach and how healthcare can can shift to this whole new type of system. And then if you can couple that with the advances that have been made in telehealth, now if I move, which again, that age group we're talking about, early 20s, you know, possibly up through mid 40s, is fairly transient too. So if my healthcare provider, or my primary care physician, isn't somebody that I have to physically go see in one specific town, but I can keep that relationship going regardless of where I live, right, that may also perhaps you know, enhance this relationship over the long term. Yeah, as you were um, talking as well, I thought of a story from when I ran an orthopedic surgery practice. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that's a specialist. These were subspecialists, you know, highly trained surgeons that had very specific practice types. And we were hiring call center people to turn away patients because so many people, when they had joint pain, were calling a surgeon's office. Mm -hmm. And so we're skipping the maybe the, the, the least invasive option because that relationship often doesn't exist, which is, which is how it begins to unwind, you know? And so we were turning these patients back to a primary care setting, type setting, it may just be urgent care, sure. to get basic workups to find out, are they really a surgery candidate? Otherwise, they really didn't belong in an orthopedic surgeon's practice. And luckily, the group that I worked with was really kind of adamant about you know, they wanted people to see their primary care doctor first. Maybe there's a more conservative option that costs, you know, exponentially less. It might be, you know, anti-inflammatories. It might be physical therapy. It might be just rest. You just ran a marathon. Your knee might hurt. You know, it's okay. You know, and those were examples that we would feel. You know, and um, so I think even though when we're well, we don't think of needing a doctor relationship. But then when we're sick or in pain. We, because that relationship doesn't exist, we end up jumping to a really invasive or really expensive level of care, whether, and you probably saw it in the emergency room, because yeah. that, that, that relationship didn't exist, so where do you go yeah. when you're sick in the middle of the night? Yeah. Go to the ER. Exactly. You know? I mean, we had, it, it was, you know, the, the common conversation we had was, is we're in the emergency department and I got into ER medicine because you want to feel that adrenaline and that rush and everybody's expecting these high intense moments all the time during your shift and you get into it and you quickly realize that you're actually doing a lot of population health in the emergency mm -hmm. department and you really see the lack of primary care that exists or individuals who have a desire to go to their primary care physician but can't get in because yes. routine or preventative or even those consultative style visits get lower on the totem pole from a prioritization standpoint in primary care physicians are so overwhelmed with treating all the acute stuff that's coming to them that they can't even get to the preventative stuff so that's where like hey i want to talk to my doctor about managing my blood pressure better but it's going to be three months later and right. so i i don't want to wait three months who wants to wait three months yeah. now for anything right. um, especially something as crucial as one's health and that's where then you put it off and an exacerbation occurs and you end up in the emergency department. And now that visit with your doctor that may have cost, you know, $100, let's say, um, now costs $1,500 mm -hmm. by going through the emergency department. And I have all the other physical, really detriments that come with that. My body has now lost years mm -hmm. of life because a chronic disease has gotten worse. Um, so you can see this perpetuation of this, the illness cycle, and um, it's really tough to break. Yeah. So from the from the employer perspective, I think one of the takeaways around this this transparency issue and then into a bit of a I don't know if it's access. I think we can mm -hmm. touch on that a little bit more later, too, yeah. but um, that their employees are struggling to navigate this really complicated system and they don't know 
that it, that their decision may be impacting, you know, the group or future premium, or they don't they don't know that um, there's an ability to get a free prescription drug over here, but over here it's a hundred dollar right. charge. You know, they they just it's so complicated that they may be struggling and frustrated with it, and and the result then is that they're kind of frustrated with the package they have, but really it's not the it's not that's not really not the core issue. It's that the system is hard. So having tools in place as part of a well-rounded benefit strategy kind of helps, you know, put the the priority in in away from the insurance product and away from the healthcare system and around the people. And let's give the tools to help them make good decisions for themselves, where otherwise they're, you know, they're kind of walking the, the terrain on their own. So those tools become really important, I think. So I think um, you hit on an important point here when you said employers, right? Employers can help their people with tools navigate the system. And that's been, um, you know, a, a frustration of mine for a long time. As I said in, in the introduction, I own an HR consulting company. Most of our clients are small businesses. And up until the, um, the health you know, insurance exchange, health insurance was tied, by and large, to your job. It's the only insurance that is tied to where you work. So employers are now on the hook to try to provide this really important benefit to their staff. And if you're a large employer, perhaps you can afford to do that. If you're a small employer, it becomes incredibly challenging. But not only are you tasked to provide health insurance, or you're expected to, especially in a tight labor market like we are right now, it becomes a competitive advantage, but you also are supposed to then help them understand how to use the product, how to use the system, and if they have a poor experience, who do they come to? They come to their HR department, <laughs> or if you're a small business, whoever happened to run the benefit meeting, which might have been the owner, it could have been the, the controller, and they say, I just got a bill and I don't understand this. So now it's not just educating the people, the consumer, but it's also educating employers to be that, you know, that advocate for their people. And employers are in the business of their industry. They're not in the business of health insurance. So it becomes incredibly important to have a partner, to have somebody that you can trust. You know, Jody, you said it perfect that these business leaders aren't in the business of healthcare. They're in whatever industry their business serves, right? And I think for too long, the broker community has been kind of let off the hook in this. And we sell a policy and then whoever it is, sometimes it's an HR person, sometimes with smaller businesses, it isn't a dedicated HR person. It's somebody who's an operations person or maybe the owner or whatever, who is relying on some support and I think there's been a gap for way too long. And so I think where we need to go with this is we need to be true consultants and advisors that are bringing more tools to the table than just the insurance product we're selling. And I think that's an opportunity for owners to look at their relationship and decide whether that's what they're getting or not. And I think it's really important and with some of the topics we were talking about before that we're putting the right priority in the right place and for too long, the priority's been in the product, an insurance product. Which, by the way, is the same price no matter who quotes it right. for health insurance, right? There are some other creative options. I know you do some things with prescription. and uh, But for a, for a general health plan, if I'm going to go with this carrier at you know this plan design, it costs me the same if you sell it to me or if you sell it to me or if Joe Schmo sells it to me down the street. That's not where the value is. And that's some advice that I'm giving to clients all the time. Who's your agent? Do you feel like you're getting everything from your agent or does your agent just show up once a year with the rate increase and run a benefit meeting over lunch? Unfortunately, because that's been so prevalent, the assumption is that's still sort of good service, quote yeah, unquote. Right. They answer they, my phone, they, they respond when <laughs> exactly I have a problem, right. and they yes. bring me my renewal every year. Yes. And um, I don't think that's the way to engage. I don't think that's how you um, produce um, high-performing benefit plans that are efficient. We talked about waste earlier. Yeah. We're not going to get to eliminating waste in plans if we're just, you know, on the hamster wheel every year up. It's, you know, getting towards renewal, and now we're looking at it 
you know, there's, there's more of a well-rounded engagement, in my opinion, that um, becomes higher value, where, you know, the, the consultant is bringing some of those tools to the table and ideas and helping the employer, you know, unpack what it is that's important to the employee. Is it just the financial security of an insurance product? If that's the case, it's a tool in my mind. It's not a strategy by itself. Where do we want to go with that tool? You know, today we might be fully insured, but maybe in five years we're going to grow and we might think about self-funding. Well, how are we going to get there? It's not up to the you know, HR person or team to unpack that, in, in my opinion. That's where we come in and provide the support, but it becomes a partnership that we become as an important uh, part of the team as, you know, the your attorney, counsel, your banker, CBI your banker yes, on down yes, the list. agreed. Because well, this is a big cost item, just like a lot of mm -hmm. these other risk areas, right? right? And so, you know, we we need to take that emphasis off the product and put it back and wrap it around the people, and then we start making different buying decisions and start creating a picture that starts meeting the needs of the employees a little better. So I think no, no, it's it's great, you know. And, and thinking about healthcare too, you have this runaway train of cost. And it's one of the biggest line items on an employer's, you know, mm -hmm. on their payroll. And Which is why a lot else. of small employers right? can't afford it to begin with. Yeah, so you have a business that is so invested in providing this to their employees, yet you have a healthcare system where the costs continue to increase, so you can see where it's going. I mean, the cost is going to only increase. There's no decrease in that trajectory. And, and you look at this more and more, and you're like, we can't accept the standard anymore. We just can't. There's got to be a break somewhere. Either it's on the healthcare side of things where hospitals do embrace transparency and they do look for ways to control costs, truly control costs. But then also on the employer's side is these are my people now. How am I going to advocate for them, help them? How am I going to provide them the solutions they need on, on that end of the spectrum as well to, to meet this, this goal? So, um, you know, from my experience, I'm not going to wait for healthcare to figure its way out. I think there's got to be creative strategies that come a lot faster, um, given the industries and how they look. And I think from the employee benefits side to creative solutions and, and new industries, how do we incorporate those into this benefits package for an employee? How do we provide them something more than an insurance policy? So we've hit on this word creative a couple of times, right? And for those that are watching, I want to make sure that they walk away with not just the idea that it could be better, um, but you know, some real concrete things that they can be thinking about within their own business or they can take back to their current um, agent and decide whether or not that agent is still the right agent, or maybe they need to contract with a few supplemental resources to sort of surround the tool and make it more of a strategy. So let's dive in, if we can, to what you're seeing on the front that might be innovative, um, it might be relevant, especially to employers, and, and certainly kind of cut out the, the middleman, the waste, the lack of transparency, et cetera. Yeah, I, there's a lot there. Uh, <laughs> Give so, us the yeah. gold, guys. Right, right. So we talked about engaging employees before. And I think one of the starting points is, are we training and educating them on how to use the system and the benefit that they have? I think some of the frustration sometimes from employees is that um, it's not clear to them how do they use it. How do they, how do they use this thing called a health savings account? What is an FSA? What is an HRA? All these acronyms we kind of throw at them, right? And whatever you know, tool we decide to employ, uh, we've got to help teach and coach them how to do it and so you know there was and not just how to do it but is this a good option for you or does it work for them right yeah and um i think that once you get into that space of training and educating um you know there was a trend for a while on wellness and i think the movement is a little away from what most people consider so quote unquote wellness and into this training and education mode on where are the points of decision making or how do you raise your hand and have other partners on the team that employees can reach out to to help navigate these really complex things you know somebody who's diagnosed with cancer like where do they go like where do they start that's a really emotional mm -hmm. challenging experience right and they may, they, not, have the they may not want to go tell their boss right. 
that this has just happened to them, but they have questions, who else can they go to? Right. So we've got the education part. I think there, there should be touch points with employees at a minimum quarterly if you want something kind of more And uh, is it the employer tactical. doing these education sessions or are you saying this is a place where an agent can come alongside and really fill that role more of a consultative partner? I think where, where what our, our um, you know, style here at OBD is we'll meet you where you want us. Okay. So some, some employer groups may have somebody or a team of people who can take it a certain part and then we'll fill and kind of meet them where they are. Yep. Some may not have it and we need to meet them a little bit farther. So we want to meet them where they are. And so we're not here to say you got to do it our way. We're not here to say you got to figure it out yourself. It's where are you and where can we best support you? Okay. So, um, so I'm we, hearing employee education. Yep. Um, I think as much as we can remind employees uh, and put in place uh, transparency tools so that they can see prices and 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 start to look at their health care as a consumer as best as possible. I think that helps um, having the right partners, um, like we've said before, that can be that independent third party that somebody might be more comfortable reaching out to. Um, yeah, and I think back to that education and training part, it doesn't have to be uh, new teaching. You know, we cram a lot into an enrollment meeting a lot. And sometimes those are 30 minutes. We got to strip that out throughout the year, each piece, almost like a page in each in the, the, um, the guide, mm -hmm. you know, once a month. Hey, don't forget about the EAP. Hey, don't forget about, you know, you know, to, to use all your flex spending money or whatever sure. the case might sure. be on down the line. So sometimes it's stripping it out because that is a hard time to absorb a lot of really complicated information, make a critical decision on your financial and right. health in a very short amount of time. And then we don't hear about it a lot of times. And typically it's calendar year renewal. So it's right around the holidays. We're right. trying to find a time when people are not on vacation. <laughs> we do. We just cram it in. Right. Yeah. Right. Nate, what are you seeing on the creative solutions side? Yeah, seeing how it's really where my mind went with health bar is that the world's colliding. Business and healthcare are colliding right now from a cost standpoint to an access standpoint to a, a benefits standpoint. And so thinking about, you know, that veil that needs to exist between the business and an individual's healthcare, because there's privacy components. Yes, I have a lot of very personal things that exist in my own health history that I don't want my boss to know or my mm -hmm. HR department to know. And, and for a wide variety of reasons, because um, I'm at that my job doing my work and I want to do that work and I don't want somebody else knowing all my business. Sure. So. But then you do have the complexities of a, a health plan as that tool. So it's like, well, who is going to explain this to me? And so you have these very significant needs and you have an individual who has really not a lot of great access points to, you know, solutions for this need. And so really it's saying, how do we take that concept of healthcare in the business environment colliding and how do we put the two together? How do, how do we bring healthcare to them, health, like health providers to them, not just insurance and not just a smoking cessation program and wellness. How do we incorporate healthcare into their business environment and their life, really? And that's, you know, we've talked about a lot with individuals not being able to access primary care and using inappropriately a lot of these medical services. And it's so, how do we solve that issue of health exists every day, all the time? How do I make it so accessible that it's a second thought and I use it in that effort to feel better, to get better and to stay better. And so, you know, I think concepts of bringing, you know, clinicians and providers directly on site, um, typically not an option though, for many small to mid-sized, even right. that low, you know, tier of larger employers, you really have to get to that very large employer threshold to be considering cost effectiveness, having an on-site clinic. So it's, it's how do we get those benefits that we know are really good or for employees that need them into the workplace to make them so accessible to where you're utilizing them on an afterthought basis. It's this is available to me and I'm going to use it. And I know exactly what I'm getting and how much that costs. Yeah. So let's yeah. think about this for a moment, because I know I've got two children in school and I know, especially as they went through elementary school, there were various points along the way where healthcare came into the school, whether it's vision screening, hearing screening, they had free dental clinics that came, my kids got their flu shots, 
for free, right? It was just showing up at the school. It made it really easy to participate. Can we learn from that model? And what are you seeing? You know, who's out there? Who's delivering these sort of, again, concierge type services? Um, and, and taking that idea of, of education and nursing and education and now moving it into the employer zone. Yeah, there's, you know, if you look at where healthcare was way back, Doc carrying around a brown bag yep, in right. your home. Very, Pendulum swing. Yeah, uh-huh. very personalized to now this huge consolidation. Everything has to exist under one roof and you have these massive health systems that are, they keep pulling more in. Um, and you look at the objectives of the healthcare systems and it's, it's growth. It's growth both on a, a physical size, a brand size, a profitability side. And, and you really see the direction they're going and to say, primary care is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And there's less and less from a resource standpoint being put to that. And, and really you see that this trend, yeah, going the completely, you know, complete opposite direction to where there was that um, previously. There were, you know, providers in schools because there's value there. Right. There's, there's, it's, tried and true. It's just, there's a industry trend in healthcare that's pushing opposite to that. So is there is there something on the market right now, and I'm truly asking this from a place of ignorance, because I'm thinking, I have clients that would be really interested in this answer. Are there services that, a, that an employer could contract with directly that are outside of maybe what's covered under a typical health plan to bring clinicians on site for some of these routine, you know, whether it's a vaccination clinic or it's a, it's a blood pressure um, screening or, you know, something like that. Again, I'm just trying to take like what's happening in the schools and trying to translate it into an employer environment. Um, if I could take the first part, cause I yeah. know you want to jump in of on course. the second part. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. um, so yes. And some of that goes back to what's the overall game plan moving forward with any employer group. Right. And, we can create the financial arrangement so that um, an employer can direct contract with providers so that there's a more direct relationship. And quite often you may get a lower cost share. Maybe it doesn't cost them anything. Sure. If they want to use that one, they don't have to, but that resource is available. And then promoting the heck out of it mm-hmm. so that they know and remember that it's there. So there are those sort of newer um, concierge type relationships where you can't have that direct contract with an employer. Certainly, you know, the bigger the group, the easier that part is. But um, I think as you look at what's creative to your earlier question, not channeling everything through the same funnel is where we start making best of breed type benefit offerings, meaning we're not just going to assume that the health insurance plan has it all covered and taken care of um, because we don't really know what's behind that curtain sometimes, you know, so how do we break it apart and do things that I call, you know, unbundling, you know, the, the plan design and put to put the right parts in the right place, depending on the group's needs. But there are those sort of direct contract relationships on Nate's earlier point. You know, primary care physicians are one of the lowest paid doctors. And so in medical school, when they're when, a, you know, a med student is deciding what track to take, that often is, a, I don't know, not the first choice because they're the least compensated and they're they're paying more and more money to get out of school. And so it becomes this other pinch point of access problems um, that we can overcome with more direct relationships. But yeah, I'll turn and, it over to you yeah, on that. In, in, in the solutions, it's what I saw from my time being in the emergency department and seeing people use us for primary care. It was there. There are there are significant access problems. These aren't you know. There's stereotypes that are you know put out there. These are these are not people in those stereotypical groups. These are you know everyday, you know normal consumers. And it's you know as as we're out there and looking at this, it's yes, there needs to be a solution. So one of the core foundational components of what we built with Health Bar was the ability to mobilize medicine. How do you take it away from that push from the health industry of getting in everything under one roof and brick and mortar, everything, and saying, healthcare should happen where you are. It shouldn't happen where I am. You know, I don't wanna make people come to me all the time for their needs. Um, let's go to them. And so we've developed a healthcare network and a system to where we provide um, licensed clinicians, uh, nurses primarily, to go on site to employers to provide screenings to provide vaccinations to provide coaching um, 
to draw your lab. So you don't have to go to an outpatient lab yeah. to have that done. I mean, think about the productivity increases that could you know occur. That missed day of work that had to happen because I scheduled my doctor's appointments. The only time I could get in, what if the doctor came to you? That right. brown bag approach of I'm carrying my stuff to your workplace and treating you there and consulting with you there and building that relationship, that primary care component is how do you affect behavioral change through momentary interactions? You, you can't, it has to be built over time, intention and with a, a certain of really a push from that healthcare provider. It's gotta be a proactive nature to it. Uh, and that's truly where these employers, I think stand to benefit significantly from strategies like that because it then does feel like a significant benefit to their workforce that actually making them healthier and happier it, it's producing right yeah, I which has that ROI for the employer yes. right I mean clearly I I want to take care of my people um, and I want to make sure they can put food on their table but I also want to make sure that they can wake up and feel good and come to work tomorrow um, and come to work for me, if at all possible, right? So anything I can do to make that easier for them, good for them, makes me look good. And if I can do it at the same cost or lower cost, why wouldn't I? But we're so conditioned under a traditional model that many of us, again, right, because employers typically are not healthcare experts, we're relying on somebody else to tell us what the options are. And when the option that we get is one, and it's called insurance and it costs this much, right? That just becomes repeated, sort of predictable decision-making and behavior. So I, I just, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm glad that the two of you have been, you know, willing to share time today and, and really talk about like, there's more out there than this and, and sort of pull that curtain back because many of us are just operating from a place of, of what we know and what we've always done. So, yeah. yeah. Agreed. Yes, you both were talking, I was thinking of this uh, quote, um, that I've heard, I can't, I don't remember who to attribute it to, but health isn't just the absence of disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so it's, and insurance helps financially protect us when we use the healthcare system, but even the healthcare system mm -hmm. has limitations. We we're putting too many eggs in those two baskets. Mm -hmm. There's more to, mm -hmm. you know, optimizing your own personal health, which mm -hmm. might mean something different for everybody. Right. Not everybody's going to be a marathon runner. You're not trying to make everybody a marathon runner. It's not the idea, right? It's, yeah. it's what's your personal optimal health status, mm -hmm. um, emotionally and physically, yeah. you know, and that's even um, kind of a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. um, but you also touch on financial incentives that keep mm -hmm. it where it is, you know, and, and we can go through kind of the supply chain and the way it's structured today incentivizes those I don't want to say providers as medical providers, but those within the supply chain, whether it's pharmacy, hospital systems, and even insurance companies, and brokers too, frankly, yep. yeah. that the financial incentive is to maintain the status quo. And I think we're both passionate about like enough, enough of that. Yeah. Like there's other ways to do it that um, that help break the cycle of, you know, like I said before, this hamster wheel that a lot of employers are kind of assuming are the only mm -hmm. option. And I think. I think there's some exciting things coming yeah. down the tracks. So I think that's a that's a great place to to end today's conversation and sort of leave our listeners maybe wanting more. I know there's a lot more we could talk for hours on this, but again, really appreciate the expertise, uh, Eric Hanna, OVD, and we've got um, Nathan as well, Nate from Health Bar, and uh, it's been a great conversation today. And and I'm sure we'll put contact information right packaging around this video too. Yeah. So if you want to reach out to either of these individuals, it'll be an easy way to do that. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you.